Okay, so this is the second of our videos looking at problem style questions and formulating an answer. Um, remember, we're looking at things very incrementally, stage by stage, so I hope that you've watched the video before because this video builds on the previous one. And remember, in that one, we started off looking at the two different types of intention, direct intention and oblique intention, and direct intention is straightforward, whereas oblique intention, what happened wasn't your aim, but it's an inseparable consequence, so it's almost like you have chosen to do something and something inseparable, something else, is attached to the decision you've made. So whatever you're going to do, something else is also going to result out of that choice that you've made. And in order for it to satisfy bleak intent, that outcome has got to be a virtually certain one. We're going to have a look at direct and oblique intent using this scenario that you can see on the screen now. So remember what I've said about looking at problem style questions and what you should always do when you open the exam paper and are faced with the examination question. Stop and pause and look very carefully at the information. The information before you is going to provide all the information on what you need to write about and what you don't need to write about. Okay, and you will know whether you're writing about direct intention or whether you're writing about oblique intention. You'll also know whether you need to discuss causation at length or whether causation is dealt with quite quickly because whatever the person has chosen to do has happened and there were no intervening acts or breaks in the chain of causation. So this particular scenario reads as follows. Wilkie shoots a gun at Colin who is driving a bus but does not wish to kill the passengers of the bus. Colin dies and a passenger Mary suffers serious injuries when the bus crashes. She consequently dies of internal bleeding. So I'm hoping that what you're doing is you're looking at those facts as already noticing whether it's direct intention or oblique intention or whether there are aspects of both there. Why don't you pause the video here and just consider for a moment whether it's direct, whether it's oblique or whether it's actually a um, mixture of the two. And once you've done that, then press play again and continue as we are doing now. So I'm hoping what you got was that it was Wilkie's direct intention to kill Colin. Now who is Colin? He's the bus driver and he is driving the bus. Okay, so the direct intention is to kill the bus driver who is driving the bus. Now this is um, Wilkie's aim or his purpose. And there was also some oblique intention in this too. Now it's not his intention, not his direct intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm to Mary. But you know from the scenario that he has done that. Now applying woolen, it was virtually certain that the bus would crash. And can you remember what we said about Woolen, Nedrick and Matthews and Elaine in the previous video? Do you remember Section 8 of the Criminal Justice Act 1967 and the guidance that the jury are provided with? Let me remind you of that. So Section 8 read, The jury shall not be bound in law to infer that the defendant intended or foresaw result from his actions by reason only of its being a natural and probable consequence of those actions. So that means just because it's likely to happen doesn't necessarily mean that the defendant um, intended it to happen. And then the section goes on to advise the jury to refer to all the evidence, drawing such inferences from the evidence as appear proper in the circumstances. So we look at everything else. How certain was it that any passengers would be injured? Was it possible? Was it highly unlikely? Was it highly probable? Was it virtually certain? Now, saying there was a greater probability is not enough. And even though previous cases, um, when the courts actually considered them like Hyam and Maloney and Hancock and Shankland, did talk about words like probability, foreseeability, how likely was it, this is not the situation now since the cases of Nedrick, Woolen and Matthews and Elaine. For murder, grievous bodily harm um, at least must be virtually certain. 
Okay, so grievous bodily harm is at least virtually certain. And it will depend, like Section 8 of the Criminal Justice Act 1967, on all the evidence. So all the evidence means, you know, we need to look at things like the speed the um, bus was travelling at, for example. Forget the fact the word bike is there, it's the bus. The speed the bu uh, bus was travelling at. And even if death or GBH were virtually certain, Wilkie must have appreciated this. So if a bleak intention is established, then the mens rea for murder will be present and he will be found guilty. We are focusing on problem style questions. But if you had an essay that looked at the mens rea for murder or looked at the problems in defining intention or the development of intention through the decades, then you would need to, as I said in the previous video, look at cases like Hyam and Maloney and Hancock and Shankland and then move on to Nedrick, Woolen and Matthews and Elaine to actually explore how the, um, the judgments developed one by one to where we have them this present day and the clarity that we, clarity that we currently have with virtual certainty. So murder requires proof of an intention to kill or cause GBH. Vickers 1957 authority point for that sentence. And remember a good law student doesn't start to write about the facts of each case. That's not what's important here. It's the actual legal principle. So murder requires proof of an intention to kill or cause GBH, as was um, discussed in the case of Vickers. At one time, intention was defined to include the defendant's foresight of the consequences as highly probable. So look, there are those words again. Highly probable, high end. And after a series of cases like Maloney um, and Hancock and Shankland, in which the definition was explored further, the law on oblique intent is at present much more settled since the cases of Nedrick and Woolen. Now, if you remember, with Nedrick came those two key questions, and, and they're also sometimes referred to as the Nedrick directions. And just to remind you what those two questions were, and both have to be answered with a yes if the jury are to find intent. And that's, was death or serious bodily harm a virtual certainty? And did the defendant appreciate that that was the case? So that information from Nedrick, which was confirmed in Woolen and then confirmed again in Matthews and Elaine, is the law as we currently have it. So from our scenario, therefore, bleak intent is currently sufficient mens rea for murder as is direct intention. Have a look at this particular very short scenario, and it is very short because in an exam in the summer you're not going to have a question that is as short as this unless you're doing a S law in which you do have very short scenarios. But we're looking at AQA A2 law, and this is just a snippet of what a problem question will look like. Eggman shoots a gun at Shadow who's riding a motorbike. Eggman wants to kill Shadow but doesn't wish to kill Amy who is Shadow's passenger. So you can see it's similar to the scenario we looked at the start of this video. So it's not going to task you too much to have a go at this one. You are transferring um, the knowledge that you've learnt um, so far into applying that information to this particular scenario. Shadow dies and Amy is seriously injured when the bike collides with a car. Amy is taken to the local hospital, but a very exhausted Dr. House treats her and underestimates the seriousness of Amy's injuries and sends her home where she dies from internal bleeding. Consider the criminal liability of Eggman for the deaths of Shadow and Amy. So we have got two victims here. Okay, we've got Shadow and Amy. And we need to take them both separately. If you remember the advice on a previous video, IDEA, identify the issue, define it, explain it and apply. And explain and apply can happen simultaneously. And when there are two people, you must take them both separately. Okay, so that's the guidance note there. Divide your answer into sections, take each victim in turn. I would advise that you pause the video here 
and you either go back and look at the information so far discussed or you have a go at formulating an answer to this. Once you've done that, then press play, press play again and continue through the information. What you'll see is um, our version of an answer to this particular scenario. Okay, so now compare your answer with ours. If you really want to make this interactive and you really want to make it work for you, then if you haven't done it already, please do so. Please pause this video, sit down, and even if you're bullet pointing it out, can you please put together an answer and then see how close your answer compares to the one that you'll see next. Here's that question again. Okay, don't be too scared if you've never seen an answer structured out like this before. So have a look at this side margin here that's in the light blue. This is a good way to maybe formulate your answers in the beginning. So if you created a template and in that template you had each segment um, with key information in it that almost like served as a memory jogger for you. So for homicide questions, in this first box within that column, you'd have things like murder, definition, carries a mandatory life sentence. That reminds you to make sure that you've included the definition and that you've included the information that it carries a mandatory life sentence. And if you know that it's going to move into manslaughter, then you know it's not going to be a mandatory life sentence. But again, it would jog your memory and it would help you do that. Always go through the actor's race of murder first, never the men's race. Start that way. So the actor's race of murder, you know that that is going to require you to look at the various elements like human being, was it lawful? And causation definitely features here. Now there's information on causation here in the order that you'd find it. So the definition of causation, it's a link between the defendant and the victim. So what the defendant does and the end result. And the two tests are that you always begin with factual causation. White is a great case as an authority case for that. And then you move on to legal causation. And remember the de minimis rule, accelerating death per Kimsey and Adams. And even though someone can be factually the cause and legally the cause, they may argue that they're still not the main cause because there was an intervening act that broke the chain of causation. And then there are a number of things that can break the cause of um, can break the chain of causation, like attempted escape by the victim, poor medical treatment, thin skull rule, self-neglect. And by having those in this side margin, you can actually think, right, is it any of those things? And if you did find that, say, it was attempted escape by the victim, you don't want to then be discussing in detail poor medical treatment or self-neglect or, um, you know, third-party intervention as per Paget. You want to focus in on information like what causation is, that there are two tests, okay, that there can be um, intervening acts that might break the chain of causation and in this particular scenario the chain of causation was broken by and then focus in on that particular one okay let's now actually go back to the main answers remember this is these are just reminders some of which you would discuss some of which you wouldn't the answer to the scenario however is here in this section okay so the white uh, background sections so how could you start you could start by saying the most serious offense and remember we're going to take shadow first by the way the most serious offense with which Eggman may be charged is murder the definition of murder is the unlawful killing of a human being under the Queen's peace with malice of forethought death occurring within three years there are various definitions just have a good solid one that covers all the AR and MR points Murder carries a mandatory life sentence. So we've covered the information there in this first box. Every time you have a murder question, you can repeat this information. Move on to AR. So your second box is going to start the same if you have another homicide question. The actus reus is to cause the unlawful death of another human being. And we can see that the AR is present because Eggman caused Shadow's death and Shadow is a person. Definition of causation. Causation is the link between the defendant's act and the end result or consequence. 
but for Eggman's conduct, um, conduct, Shadow might still be alive. So we can say that Eggman is the factual cause of death. White in brackets there to show that we know which case illustrates this point that we've just made. Legal causation requires him to be more than a minimal cause of death, Kimsey. And to have accelerated death. And the key case for that point is Adams. There is evidence of this, so both factual and legal causation can be proved. Eggman cannot argue any intervening acts that may have broken the chain of causation. The link between Eggman and the end result is therefore clearly intact. It is so important okay, that you don't put in any unnecessary information. Remember, with problem style questions, is 50% the law, it's 50% application, how you apply the law correctly. So have a look at this guidance note in the blue margin. In this part of the scenario, you need only refer to the key points on causation in a clear, succinct fashion. This is because you have a number of points to consider, and causation is not controversial here. So you wouldn't run through all the different breaks in the chain of causation that could possibly happen. This is not an essay on causation. This is a problem question. And for shadow, there is no intervening act or anything that has broken the chain of causation. So we don't need to discuss any of those things. Now that we've done that, okay, we can finish by saying, you could have said this first, or you can, you can finish off with it. The death is unlawful, as there is no evidence of self-defense, and it occurs within the Queen's peace. Okay, so it covers the AR elements of the murder definition. Now we're moving on to the mens rea of murder, which is our next um, box in our blue margin. And you know that this is either intention to kill or cause GBH, so both express malice and implied malice. And make sure you apply this to the scenario. So once we've um, explained it, make sure it's been applied. So the mens rea for murder is an intention to kill or cause GBH, which you would need to write. When Eggman shoots to kill Shadow, it is his direct intention to kill Shadow, as this is his aim or his purpose. Therefore, the mens rea for murder is also present. Eggman will be guilty of Shadow's murder. And you can see that all the way through, our application is threaded through. So we're explaining and applying. Explaining and applying. Every time you see names mentioned of the people within the scenario, you're applying. Um, a good tip that I heard from a university professor once was in a problem style question in each paragraph aim to have the names of the people in the scenario. I have heard about other versions of how to formulate answers and they are also equally correct. There's not one particular way in which you can formulate an answer so long as you've covered all the key ingredients and you show a skillful application of the law. You may choose to explain all the law and then apply at the end and you can do it that way but you'll find with the ones that you're looking at now the explanation and the application happen simultaneously. Now we need to take our second victim, poor Amy, who has died. So again, can you see how it starts in a similar fashion? Each of the boxes here, the blue boxes, all look the same. So it all starts up again. And we are identifying the first most serious offence here or issue for us to look at is murder. The most serious offence with which Eggman may be charged is murder. Now, if you're saying this for a second time, you don't have to um, write out the definition for murder again. You can say it like this. The definition is as above, as is the sentence. Then move on to the actus reus of murder. Now, the actus reus of murder here is going to be very, very different. Okay, if you can remember from our scenario that there, um, there isn't a situation where there's been no intervening acts. There has been an intervening act. So we're going to cover causation in more depth here. They are as to cause the unlawful death of another human being. Amy is clearly a person. No evidence of self-defense and the death occurs within the Queen's peace. This is just to show you another way of actually um, dealing with the, that information could be to deal with it at the start. Whereas with Shadow, I ended up dealing with that particular sentence at the end. 
However, it may be more difficult to establish, cause, establish causation in relation to the death of Amy. The rules of causation must now be applied. The test for factual causation is the but-for test, White 1910. But for Eggman shooting Shadow, the motorbike would not have crashed and killed Amy. Thus, factual causation is established. Slightly different way of writing it. In relation to legal causation, Eggman's actions need not be the sole cause of death, as long as he is more than a minimal cause of death, Kimsey, and has accelerated death, Adams. So legal causation is also established. However, even though this is the case, Eggman may argue that his actions are not the only cause of death, that there has been an intervening act that has broken the chain of causation. He may argue that poor medical treatment may also have contributed to Amy's death. Now, this is interesting. I want you to really note this, because if you look in this sidebar here, you can see all the various ways in which the chain of causation might have been broken. Now, it wasn't through the thin skull rule. It wasn't through self-neglect. It wasn't through any drug cases or third-party intervention. And it wasn't through attempted escape by the victim. It was, however, possibly poor medical treatment. And that is the one you need to pick out and write about. According to the case law, negligent medical treatment will not break the chain of causation where the act of the original act, um, attacker was a substantial and operating cause of death, Smith, 1959. The courts are reluctant to remove liability from a defendant who is responsible for having started the chain of events. One exceptional case does exist, though. In the exceptional case of Jordan, 1956, the chain of causation was deemed to be broken as medical treatment in this case was described as having been palpably wrong. Bear in mind, this case is a standalone extreme example. Applying the case of Cheshire, also known as the Cheshire Test, it must be asked whether the doctor's act of misdiagnosing Amy's injuries was so independent of Eggman's act and so potent in causing Amy's death that it renders Eggman's actions as insignificant. In the light of these cases, it appears to be very unlikely that the actions of Dr. House will break the chain of causation, and so Eggman will be found to have caused Amy's death. In the blue box, have you applied the law to the scenario? Guidance note, causation is more controversial here, and as you have seen, it clearly is. I hope that you're getting to see the pattern now, what you need to do, and why 50% of your marks do come from good application of the law. So now that we've covered the AR for Amy, the murder of Amy, we're now moving on to what we would move on to naturally, which is the mens rea of murder. And again, just to remind you, this is intention to kill or cause GBH. Once we've done that, we will apply it to the scenario. So we'll now consider whether Eggman had the required mens rea for murder, which is an intention to kill or cause GBH, because... It was not Eggman's direct intention to kill or cause GBH to Amy. However, he may have oblique intent. Applying wool in, it's virtually, virtually certain that the bike would crash when Eggman shot and killed Shadow, and that Amy would be caused GBH. Even if death or GBH was virtually certain, it would then need to be shown that Eggman appreciated this. Remember Section 8, Criminal Justice Act? If oblique intention can be established, then the mens rea for murder will also be present, and Eggman will be found guilty of Amy's murder. If there is no oblique intent, he will not be, though this is highly unlikely to be the case. Okay, so in this video, we considered a very short scenario, and we looked at application of both the actus reus and the mens rea. Now, it would be a very, very useful exercise to actually write out this information and have it before you. Okay, and then have a go at looking at past paper questions and maybe just shorter ones or breaking them down into short areas where you're just covering the AR and the MR at the level of, you know, homicide offence. Okay, and you know, sort of really pay close attention to the information that gets repeated again. It's important that you have good definitions. It's important that you know the structure. It's important that you know that AR is, AR is always discussed before the mens rea and that 
very few high grade um, answers will run through the facts of the particular cases that are mentioned with them. So there's no need to mention, for example, the factor of facts of the case of Vickers or the facts of the case of Woolen. It's the legal principle that's most important. Okay, so for oblique intent, you need virtual certainty as per Woolen. And if you wanted, you could you could have had here in brackets Nedrick, the year, comma, Woolen the year. And even when it comes to the year of the cases, in the for the purposes of the A-level exam, it's not necessary that you do actually remember all the dates. So I'm hoping that this video is also um, useful to you. It would be beneficial to listen to it again. This is a new skill. It's different from your AS law. And it's going to be something that you're going to build on incrementally and become more and more skillful at doing. Okay, so look out for the next video. Thank you for running through this one. Make sure you make the most of it by running through it again, writing it out and having a look at it and seeing where the um, patterns arise within problem style um, answers to such type of questions. Okay, thank you. and. I will see you again soon on the next video.